The title of today's webinar is the ACSF uh, colon SC tool, the Autism Classification System of Functioning uh, for social com and colon social communication. And with us today, we have three great presenters from the uh, Can Child Center for uh, 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 Can Child Center for Childhood Disability Research. Uh, put their website up on the page there. You can find out lots more information about Can Child at CanChild.ca. Uh, but with us today, specifically, we have three great presenters from uh, from CanChild, uh, Dr. Peter Rosenbaum, Dr. Briano Di Rezzi, and Martha Cousins. Uh, Dr. Rosenbaum certainly needs no introduction to the CAFC community and to the CAFC Presents audience, as they as many of you may have heard uh, one of his previous webinars on some of his other work in the program called Parenting Matters. Dr. Ro uh, Rosenbaum is the lead investigator for this project on development of an autism classification system of functioning. Uh, his work is extensive and I won't go into it. I mean, there's lots of links on the, uh, on the Can Child page where you can certainly see the, the full breadth of his research, but of particular interest might be his work in the gross motor function classification system for children with cerebral palsy, which again, anyone working in the field of cerebral palsy, I'm sure is familiar with that work and the, the important groundwork that that laid for his, uh, his interest in classification of, for a uh, classification system for autism. Uh, also with us, we have Dr. Briano Di Rezzi, who is the co-investigator uh, for this program. And uh, Dr. Uh, Di Rezzi is uh, uh, formerly, an, or well, not formerly, but is an, is an OT who's uh, doing research and has been working closely with children with ASD and their families for at least 10 years now, and has a research program that focuses on measurement development to increase the rigor of intervention research for children with ASD and other neurodevelopmental disorders. And we also have with us uh, is uh, Martha Cousins, who's the project coordinator and knowledge broker uh, for this project. Uh, and uh, Martha works on a number of other projects uh, at CanChild. Uh, again, uh, more information is in their bios that you can see on their screen, or you can click through to the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network and uh, get lots more information on this. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Rosenbaum to uh, get this uh, presentation started. Over to you, Dr. Rosenbaum. Thanks very much, Doug. Um, can so I need to show my screen. So yes, I'm you paying do. attention. <laughs> and is my screen showing? Your screen is showing, and there's your presentation. Excellent. Thank you. Um, well, I just want to underscore one particular uh, point that Doug made, and that is, uh, as we were talking offline, uh, the three of us know what we're going to tell you, and we know that uh, it's all it all makes sense to us. What's going to be really important this morning is that if you hear things that either sound weird or that don't make sense to you, uh, please, please ask us, please challenge us, because every time we present our ideas, uh, we want people's feedback about what uh, they need clarity about, um, and we will not be shy or embarrassed or upset to have your questions and comments as we go along. Um, Doug's introduced the fact that we're interested in uh, autism and uh, classifying social communication, and we'll explain this this morning. You'll see on uh, the slide uh, about the research team that uh, Martha Briano and I are the people who are actually in the building together uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, and have done uh, a lot of the grunt work, and I would say that, <clears throat> that Martha and Brianna really deserve much more credit than I do uh, for keeping this project very active. Lonnie Zweigenbaum and Peter Zotmari are both well-known, uh, internationally known Canadian uh, autism uh, specialists uh, who have contributed and continue to contribute importantly. Mary Jo Cooley-Heidecker is a speech-language pathologist in the States who's a close friend and colleague of mine, and you'll hear in a minute why she's involved in this project. Mary Law is a very well-known and experienced occupational therapist with a huge experience of disability research, and Paul Stratford is a biostatistician colleague down the hall with whom we work closely. Uh, and so uh, all of us are involved, uh, but the three of us are presenting today. Um, the ACSFSC is a silly mouthful of, of a syllable or a vowel of uh, letters rather that stand for the Autism Classification System of Functioning uh, and where the functioning is about social communication. 
And what we want to do this morning is to tell you why we're focusing on social communication and how we got to where we are right now. Um, so, some context, and you'll notice in red, and you'll probably hear this several times, the autism classification system is not a new test. It is not a new assessment of autism. And the reason for being so emphatic about this is we have repeatedly been told that there are already lots of tools like the ADOS and the ADIR and the CARS and so on, and this alphabet soup of tests, and we keep saying this is not a test. What it is meant to be is a pattern recognition system that would allow us, professionals and parents, to identify a level of functioning that best fits with this child right now. And we're trying to promote, to develop and promote a common language within the ASD field. And as you'll see, and we'll probably get into this in discussion, a lot of the way we talk about things is pretty negative. We talk about what people can't do. We talk about it. We have a deficit based approach to things. And we're trying to uh, suggest, based on other work I'm going to tell you about in a minute, we're trying to suggest that there may be another way to think about this. So, again, we are not creating a new test. We are creating a new tool, which is meant to be a way to group people who are functioning in a similar way at this particular time. We're also focusing on preschoolers at this stage because we thought this was the shallow end of the pool and one had to jump into the pool somewhere. But we recognize, and, and this again is a point for further discussion, that this is only the beginning and certainly by no means uh, the final answer. So uh, Brianno uh, and I started working together two or three years ago, four years ago, I suppose, um, around his interest in autism and, and my interest in functional classification. And Brianna led a project which led to a, uh, a publication last year um, in which it was possible with colleagues from around the world, and those colleagues included experts and uh, expert parents and expert professionals, uh, who together identified social communication as the key common element across people with ASD. And we recognize that the classical description of ASD is a triad of, of communication deficits, behavioral issues, and what's the third one? Cognitive. Cognitive. cognitive elements. But of course, there are people with ASD who don't, do not have cognitive elements or problems. And there are people with ASD for whom behavior is not a big issue. But what everybody seems to have in common is difficulties in social communication. And the reason for identifying this, as you'll see, is we're trying to focus at this point on what seems to be the classical common element of difficulty in everyone who has ASD. Uh, and uh, we'll talk in a minute about cerebral palsy uh, and how we did that there. A classification system uh, is the classification systems are are very widely used, and we'll show a couple of examples in a minute. What they are are standardized systems that provide clinicians and families with reliable, that is to say, consistent, valid, that is to say, meaningful and true information that allows us to talk about communication, allows us to, to, to communicate effectively about what we're talking about, and stratification, that is to say, to have people at different levels uh, so that when we have an intervention or we have an outcome, we can say, well, what's that who's that intervention for? Or When you're talking about the outcome, are we talking about people in level X or level Y? Um, and we're very keen, and we have evidence that all of bring up in a minute, we're very keen to have information and descriptions of people's function so that we can look at relevant interventions. An intervention that might work for a person in one level might not work for somebody in a different level because of any of a number of reasons. Botulinum toxin and cerebral palsy is an example. Uh, its use is designed for particular purposes and uh, so the question is, botulinum toxin help? Well, the answer is it depends who you're talking about and what issue you're talking about. We also want to be able to predict long-term outcomes. 
Um, so how do people do when they have condition X? Well, it depends on how severe uh, condition X is. Uh, we also want to guide management. What's the appropriate treatment for such and such? Well, it depends on the manifestations of such and such. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of reasons to have a classification system, and we would argue very strongly that such a system does not exist in autism. And talking about high functioning and low functioning is really not very helpful, partly because people don't agree on what they mean by high functioning and low functioning. So a few systems that people will be familiar with, the International Classification of Functioning, the World Health Organization's 2001 uh, enterprise, uh, is meant primarily to be a classification system. I personally don't think it's a very good classification for a whole host of reasons, but the framework that many of us like is very useful. And so when we talk about personally, when we around at Kanjal, when we talk about the ICF, we are primarily talking about the uh, the many elements of body structure and function, activity and participation, and so on that we think are useful. But we're not using the classification of functioning that is described in the very large manual. Uh, anybody who uh, either has had a baby or has worked with kids will know about the APGAR score. APGAR was named for named for Virginia APGAR, who in the 1950s recognized that we needed to know what attention, which babies needed attention in the first few minutes after they were born. And so we say in brackets here, this is for stat treatment. Uh, if a baby's got a good APGAR score, they're probably breathing well, their heart's working well, they're moving, and so on. If they have a low APGAR score, it probably means that they, it does mean that they need attention, and one has to look very carefully at why their score is low. So it serves a tremendously important function. We know from our colleagues who work in cancer that there are all sorts of cancer staging systems. Uh, we have it in, in kids with leukemia. We have standard risk leukemia, high risk, and extremely high risk. And these, uh, or, or in, in Hodgkin's disease, we have stages one, two, three, four, and these are all based empirically on how the cancers present, the age, in the case of kids, the age at which they present, the severity of their blood count, and so on. And those things are associated with different approaches to treatment and different outcomes. Uh, and there are lots of classification systems in cerebral palsy, as we'll talk about briefly. Um, in the, the classification that we started developing, as Doug said, was the gross motor function classification system. And this was developed at Canchild by a group of us who were pretty frustrated with the fact that we were talking about kids having mild, moderate, or severe CP and really didn't know what we were talking about. Um, and we in the field didn't know what we were talking about, partly because we didn't, nobody had ever defined these terms, nobody had ever showed that the, uh, a group of us would classify kids in the same way, so we didn't know the words were used reliably. And by creating the gross motor function classification system, which looked only and exclusively and specifically at gross motor function, we we're able to develop something that is now used all over the world that uh, it, it would be very, very hard for people to pick up an article in a journal that talks about cerebral palsy that doesn't report the categories of the gross motor function classification system simply as part of the background. What we did here was to identify that the hallmark construct or the hallmark issue in cerebral palsy is gross motor difficulty. That isn't to say that we're, uh, we're forgetting about fine motor problems, communication, epilepsy, and so on. We know that those things can happen. But what everybody in the world has in common is a problem in the development of gross motor function, and that's where we started. And what, the, and what we created was a series of what we like to call word pictures, which simply describe five levels of function from level one, which is most uh, capable, to level five, which is uh, least capable, and focuses on children's self-initiated movement, in other words, whole body activity, such as sitting and walking. And the uptake of this across the world has been quite remarkable, uh, much more than we ever intended it to be. Um, what it did then was create a common language for levels of functional severity, a stratification system so that people can report their outcomes by GMFCS level. 
Uh, they can test interventions. They can predict later ability, and we've validated all of this in, in our work in the past 15 years. It's a very quick clinical tool. It's correlated with detailed clinical assessments, very strongly clear. So this is where we can say that the GMFCS is not, a tool, is not an assessment, but it correlates strongly with assessments. It can be used in a minute, literally a minute or less, whereas many of our assessments take a half an hour or an hour. And the classifications are meaningfully different from one another, which is important for being client-centered. Um, and this is just an example. I don't expect people to read this, but in level, you see in level one, um, we have a, just a word picture of children floor sitting, and in level two, they can do some things, but they have some difficulties, and in level five, they have significant functional limitations. And we know that parents, when they're ready to, to ask about this, about this, can be shown the GMFCS and can identify their child's level of functioning. In the same way that geneticists will show parents either a verbal description or a picture of a condition they think the child has and the parents can identify it. Um, we uh, have, as you'll see, uh, developed word pictures for various ages. We're simply showing you the, the second to fourth birthday word pictures. Levels one, two, three, four, and five are defined and described differently for kids between four and six, six and 12, and over 12. And that's simply because motor function changes as does social communication, which is why I was saying earlier that we're just starting by looking at preschoolers. Um, and this is some work that colleagues in Germany have done. Here you see five what we call motor growth curves. This is based on work we did and published 10 years ago to show patterns of motor development by children in different GMFCS levels from one at the top to five at the bottom. And you'll see how these curves vary by age and obviously vary by GMFCS level. And what our German colleagues have done is to put on um, ideas about the kinds of interventions one might think about at different ages for kids in different levels. And the details, again, don't matter, but it's just a nice illustration of how other people have, have been imaginative in, in applying this work. The uh, ACSFSC is different from clinical measures because it's meant to categorize levels of functioning. We said, and we we'll keep saying, it's not a test. It gives us a picture of that aspect of functioning that is broader than what a test score does, because a test score by itself doesn't tell us what a person can do. Um, and it is a system that is meant to describe, but not to explain. And that's also very important. We're not asking why the person is in that level. That's a, that's a separate, later, important question. But at the beginning, where do they fit? And there's a considerable amount of, of opportunity to begin to look at people who are all in the same level and see how they differ from one another, to perhaps ex understand how they got there, to find out whether people in that level are all going to improve in the same way, and if not, what are the factors that are influencing that. But we simply don't have that kind of information available to us yet. Um, the, when we developed the, and published the gross motor function measure classifications uh, system, we were hassled by our friends, our occupational therapy friends, who told us we'd forgotten to be interested in manual function. And we said, no, we hadn't forgotten. We left it out on purpose, uh, not because it wasn't important, but because we were trying to focus expressly on gross motor function. And they said, well, but you need to have something for manual ability. And we said, we agree. Why don't you do it? And they took up the challenge, a group of colleagues in Sweden, uh, one of whom came and spent several months with us, and we worked together to develop the manual ability classification system, which is now available on the, on the web. And then <clears throat> while this was happening, colleagues in, uh, at Michigan State uh, called me and said, uh, we want to do a similar thing for communication. And that led to the communication function classification system, which is also published. And there is now some work being published that is reporting on populations of kids with cerebral palsy who have all three of these classifications done and looking at how they do and do not relate to one another. 
And so what's important here is we're getting under the surface of the Gestalt overview and being able to look at details. And just because you are functionally limited in terms of gross motor function doesn't mean your manual abilities are poor, doesn't mean your communication abilities are poor. And so this is helping us to, to look in more detail at things. And the feeding system that's under, under development in the UK is one I'm aware of because they've asked for some input from us. And we've been trying for a long time to get a system for uh, autism uh, spectrum disorders. And uh, the reason that I'm doing it is because we couldn't get anybody else to do it. Tried for years, talked at a meeting at NIH, talked to Canadian colleagues many times, and people would look at us a little bit puzzled. Sometimes they'd say, no, it's too complicated. And we would just say, no, it's just complicated, which we know it to be. Um, we think the field really needs this, and this is why we're doing it. Um, so, are, am I still talking? I think I'm up. Okay, Brianno, <laughs> Brianno, let me introduce Brianno. Brianno, welcome, take it away. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, so, as um, as Peter was saying, uh, really, the uh, the importance of uh, this type of tool that has been uh, so useful in cerebral palsy uh, is is our approach to this project. Um, and essentially to develop uh, an evidence-based way to classify um, preschool-aged children with ASD um, and focusing in particular on uh, social communication abilities. So, you know, the, there's, um, there are uh, centers across this country, across North America, that has, have likely, and, and I know of some, that have developed their own sorts, sorts of tools to help categorize children, um, but often um, there isn't um, a reliability in how they're being used within their centers, across centers, uh, as well as the, uh, the construct uh, of what the uh, classification is based on is often mixed. And so really we're, we're, we're honing in on something that's evidence-based from the experts that we, uh, that we know, know these children best. And um, and really focusing on social communication abilities as the um, as the construct, and so as um, as I move to the next slide here, the um, this tool um, is needed to to be something that would be consistently used and valid uh, across centers, and so um, something that can be used between professionals, um, and as well as um, including parents uh, to to understand. The usefulness uh, of, of a tool like this uh, for many purposes that we'll talk about in, in, a, in a little bit. But uh, a tool like this can describe functioning and is free of, of the value-laden laden terms, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, mild, moderate, and severe, as people use those words um, with um, sort of different meaning um, within the field. And, and again, to emphasize what children can do. Um, there's lots of literature that's, well, not a lot of literature, but there is literature that describes um, the importance of strength-based um, uh, e evaluation in some ways um, in terms of uh, children with disability and in particular with autism, but not a lot of tools that have uh, demonstrated this type of work. So we really feel that um, by creating word pictures that uh, parents and professionals can identify, we can, we can then uh, construct some of the meaning um, uh, that, uh, that fills a, a big void in the field. So how can this tool be used? Um, and and I, I loosely mentioned this in the previous slide, but really um, where parents and professionals are involved, we want to make sure that everyone's speaking the same language. And, and so really as a communication tool, I think um, this would be hugely helpful um, so that we know that everyone is, um, is speaking about levels in the same way. And as a tool to, to classify children by social communication, this would be useful for, for research purposes. So grouping children who have similar abilities um, within a study, as well as um, for uh, clinical programs um, or educational purposes, where we get a sense of um, children that have um, similar abilities uh, and how they can um, be successful in um, picking up uh, whatever is being delivered within their sessions. Um, and so this can also be useful for goal planning. As a, as a therapist, this is something that uh, I've, I've um, felt has been hugely needed in terms of understanding what the needs are and communicating similar goals um, uh, from a parent's perspective um, and having a partnership uh, within the clinical context. 
and uh, it, it can also be used as, as Peter had, had demonstrated um, one of the, the slides that looked uh, longitudinally um, how um, children with um, gross motor function classifications uh, levels uh, perform. Uh, it gives us a sense of future status and, uh, and potentially the waves of, uh, of status over time. And we know social communication is, is very different than gross motor um, function, but I think to get a sense of what's happening over time to get a sense of the natural history of autism um, and potentially the influences of certain interventions will be something that will be hugely useful uh, for us in the field moving forward. So a bit about our project. Um, I guess we should get to that at this point. <laughs> um, really, the, um, there's two phases to our work and we've been working on this since 2011. Uh, and uh, phase one has largely consumed most of that time and, and, it's, and it's identifying really the, the content and the, the foundational um, meaning of, of the levels and, uh, and of social communication in terms of functioning. So, uh, so this was a co content validation phase and we, uh, we aimed at identifying observable social communication. Um, and, and listen to experts through a series of focus groups and, and uh, that included parents, educators, and health professionals um, and, and separately uh, listen to them about their knowledge and experience. We looked at the literature to see how social communication was defined and uh, the assessments that were used to define social communication and found that really there wasn't um, much out there that defined uh, it in terms of everyday abilities uh, and how we've been looking at it. But uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, phase one in a second, uh, but just to give you an overview of, of phase two, we, we plan and we've started to field test the tool with parents and professionals um, to get a sense of how, uh, how it's working um, within the clinical setting. Um, and then the goal is to analyze how, these, um, how, the, how the tool uh, describes and captures social communication compared to commonly used tools. And as Peter mentioned before, the uh, this tool isn't uh, isn't a measure, but uh, will complement the existing measures out there. The ADI and the the Vineland are the are the two that we're, we're planning to use um, in uh, in our content uh, in our uh, validation phase, and, and really getting a sense of uh, how well the um, our tool um, uh, aligns uh, with the appropriate um, domains from these tools is how we plan to use them. So the timeline to date, as I mentioned, we started uh, at the bottom of the slide. You can see is was when we began in uh, September of 2011, and um, and um, conducted uh, three rounds of focus groups. So as I mentioned, we we talked to parents, um, clinicians, and educators each separately in three in three separate rounds of groups. So uh, first group for each of them was asking about what is social communication, what is the meaning of it in terms of everyday life. Um, uh, second group you know, looked to talk a little bit about um, what are, are some of the meaningful constructs that, uh, that are important in terms of levels of functioning. And so from these three rounds of groups with these, um, uh, these experts, we, uh, we were able to develop a tool that... Uh, <laughs> Peter's messing around with it. <laughs> Peter, yeah. um, we were able to develop um, really the, the tool, a draft of the tool that we were then able to um, bring to um, a, a group in May of 2012 when we had um, IMFAR here in Toronto. Um, a separate group of people that were mixed experts, um, parents, clinicians, and uh, educators as well, to say, what do you guys think of this? This was generated from our, our focus groups. Um, and so we, uh, we um, had a... Um, uh, a process where they were able to, to um, provide feedback uh, throughout the day into uh, mixed focus groups. So we continued to revise, um, you know, um, in between these phases of data collection, we would, um, we would share this with our, our team and work through the feedback. So this whole process has been a lot of uh, revising and, 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 and accessing professionals to get feedback. So as you see in September 2012, we shared the tool with our participants from the focus groups to, to ask what they thought and, and got a really good response from them in terms of um, their thoughts on where it is, where it's at, its clarity, its comprehensiveness. And, it, and conceptually, 
whether it could be useful uh, for a, a child that they had in mind uh, that could be um, uh, rated at a, at a particular level of ability. Again, in um, from September to December 20, uh, 2012, um, we started to um, ask others in terms of their um, outside of that group uh, internationally in, in, through a survey to ask them about the clarity, comprehensiveness, and application as well. And from there, we were able to um, also get some really positive feedback on the tool in terms of its uh, in terms of it identifying. Um, the appropriate range of abilities. And, that, and that's uh, one thing I want to emphasize as well, that this tool looks at identifying the range of abilities for children with autism at a preschool age, at a preschool age level. So really um, seeing what the uh, uh, abilities of, of, of they can be uh, throughout um, this time period. And so now we're at a stage at the top, as you can see, um, we've started reliability testing. Uh, and, and we've kind of um, mixed in that with some feasibility to get a sense of what people are thinking about using this tool. So parents are driving this um, and giving it to their um, professionals uh, that know and, uh, and work closely with their children. So I'll pass it over to Martha. Thank you. So what does it look like? Probably a lot of people are wondering, so we're going to show you. Um, so along with the tool is a user guide that we've thought really long and hard about and revise. And it's giving really people that are going to use the tool a background about uh, where we're coming from and how to use the tool. So the user guide is, is a lot longer than the tool. It's six pages and it includes a background explaining what we mean by social communication and where, and, um, where, we, where we're coming from definitions of keywords and concepts, including what we mean by social communication and what it looks, what it looks like. Um, in the tool, we talk about what a child's capacity, social communication capacity looks like and what their typical performance looks like. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then also really key information about what the tool can and cannot do. So people really understand that, again, it's not a test. Um, how might you use this tool, how you should not use this tool, and so forth. There we go. So this is uh, the beginning of the tool itself. It's actually in a, in a booklet style, and I think it's uh, four pages printed on both sides. So it's you know nice, short, and sweet, and easy, you know, easy for people to take a look at. Um, basically, at the beginning, we do give people instructions about how to choose. So along with the user guide, we have uh, four steps where we tell um, whoever will be using the tool how they should use it that they should review the user guide first and should also review the tool first before they start to think about what their child's level or what the child's level may be. Um, so in step three, we talk about, um, I'm sorry, and again, it's in the last month that we're asking people to think about what the child's social communication abilities are. So step three says, think about what are the best social communication abilities you observe this child doing, even if it has only been observed once, and this is called their capacity. So um, parents, educators, clinicians are asked to rate what this child's capacity level is. Then we ask them to like, take a look at the tool again and think about in the last month, what are the social communication abilities that you've observed this child doing most consistently? And this would be their typical performance. So it's two ratings. Um, and then there's just a few other um, hints and emphasis for um, people that will be rating it including at the bottom that we're talking about both um, verbal and nonverbal forms of social communication. Yeah, so this is just the other side. So again, I said it's really, it's like one page back and front in a booklet style. Um, so the way that the tool works is it starts at level five um, and moves down towards level one. So five would be, um, the more impaired social communication abilities and level one would be the highest social communication abilities. I'm not going to go through what all the different levels are, but just to tell you briefly, I'll, I'll read out what level five says and what level one says. So level five says, in the last month, a child in level five may be observed talking to themselves or playing with objects, trying to initiate or react to other people's specific words or physical actions, although the purpose of their communication may only be understood by their primary caregiver 
or highly experienced teacher or therapist. And then level one, in the last month, the child in level one has been observed initiating and responding to communicate for social purposes about more than just their preferred interests and activities with most people. Sustaining communication with most people, although they may have some difficulty, they will try to respond to the change in topic, activity, or use effective communication strategies to be understood. And then on the far right, um, opposite the tool, or opposite the levels, and we did this on purpose, is a little bit more of an explanation that are the distinctions between the levels. So when someone is reading it through and they're really trying to figure out whether a child is at the level above or the level below, we believe that the distinctions will give them more clarity around that. And I think I'm going to give it back to Brianno. He's going to talk about a little bit more detail about the tool. So, so in, in general, as, as Martha was, was mentioning, I'll just take a step back here again. Um, as you can see, the, the levels, the distinctions are, are, are aimed to be helpful for people who are stuck on what level the, the child should be at. Um, and essentially across the levels, there are similar, um, the, the, the two foundational uh, constructs that have come out of the focus groups and all of the iterations that we've gone through in phase one uh, really look at the uh, the intention of communication as well as the um, skills and strategies that um, that the, the children are using. So those are the two constructs that are constant throughout um, throughout each of the levels um, and how the children are are, um, are uh, evaluated in terms of their ability. And so the tool. Um, as, we, as we've said many times already, it, it is not a test, it is not a, a diagnostic or assessment tool. It really is meant to be used after a child receives a diagnosis. And, and the users are parents and professionals and educators who know the children well. So it's not a child that comes in for a first visit um, and the tool is used on them. Um, this we, we, we recognize based on the, the, the complexity of social communication and, and, and knowing what a child can do. Um, so I think that that's, needs to be emphasized in, in how we plan uh, this tool to be used. And the third bullet uh, is, uh, is what I had mentioned, the intent for communicating um, is, is one, of the, uh, one aspect of each level and the other aspect is the uh, skills and strategies. So um, the five levels um, we, we aimed, you know, one of the wonderful benefits of having such an experienced team is uh, all the different tools uh, that have been developed um, over time, um, you know, we, we've learned from them. And, and one of the aspects that I think is, is really um, uh, neat about this one is that uh, we do start with um, uh, a lower level ability at, uh, at the top so that um, when a parent goes through it, it's, it's about identifying uh, what the child um, can do at, at one of the levels, even if it's at the top, uh, rather than going through, uh, no, can't do that, can't do that, um, till they get to the bottom. So, um, so some of these subtleties, I think, uh, have been hugely important in, in terms of uh, how this has been, uh, the, the thought that we put in, in terms of designing this. Um, and again, each level, as you can see, is a word picture. It describes what the child can do. Um, and, and again, we're not trying to explain why. Um, and you might have children who have uh, different um, needs at, uh, within each level. Um, but I think, as Peter mentioned uh, earlier, it's something that we will need to explore down the road. First and foremost, we need to find a way to categorize um, consistently. Uh, and that's the biggest need that we think um, uh, this contributes to. Um, as I mentioned, I uh, got a bit ahead of myself, the, uh, it really isn't for a one-time observation. The pe person needs to be familiar with the child. And the recall is over the last month. And this is part of what we're going to be examining in this feasibility slash reliability uh, part of phase two, is getting a sense of how, um, um, how uh, we can, uh, we'll be observing on, on two time points um, what that's like. And, uh, but we think that that's uh, a pretty consistent um, time period where abilities won't change. Uh, and then the classification uh, levels are not based on um, whether a child is verbal or nonverbal. And this is something that came out of our focus groups. We had uh, parents involved in our groups that, um, one in particular that I can think of, had a, a, a two children with autism, um, and one was verbal, one was nonverbal, and emphasized in some ways that the childhood nonverbal uh, abilities 
um, had better social communication skills. So I think we really tried to keep that in mind that that wasn't going to discriminate um, or, or um, uh, put a child in a particular high level because they had verbal abilities, but really tried to uh, think about uh, what they can do at each level. Um, um, regardless as to what their verbal abilities were. And, uh, and, and as Mar Martha mentioned as well, the whole idea of um, capacity versus performance. Um, I mean, the, the role of the environment in influencing a child's abilities in any given time or over multiple times uh, was a theme that continued to come out of our groups. And we really, um, in, in trying to find a way to um, uh, to make a tool like this uh, feasible, we felt that uh, taking into account these environmental uh, differences um, could be captured by um, evaluating um, the typical performance versus the, uh, their capacity. And so I think that, that is another example of how we've um, pulled out themes from our groups um, and had um, our, our participants um, give us feedback on them and everyone seemed to be um, pretty content with, uh, with how that's used. And so, and really today, uh, Martha will talk a little bit about our, our reliability phase and, and where we're at right now. Thank you. So our reliability phase began uh, in March and um, we hope to be completed by August 2013. So at the moment we're across uh, you know, five to seven sites in Ontario and Alberta. Uh, so Halton, Hamilton, Toronto, Edmonton, and Oshawa. Our aim is to recruit 50 parents of children between um, sorry, 50 parents of children between the ages of three to five years old with a diagnosis of ASD in total. That's across all of the sites, so in total. Um, we're asking the parent to identify one to two professionals who provide care for their child and are familiar with their social communication abilities to be additional raters. So this um, could be either speech language pathologist, occupational therapist, psychologist, early childhood educator, recreational therapist, there's a whole list of different uh, people that may be working with their child and may know them very well. Um, so we're including that. What are we asking participants to do? So we're asking all parents to obviously consent um, and uh, complete a consent and information form. And then there is a um, study booklet. So there's a demographic questionnaire that really just asks a few questions about their child's age of diagnosis, how old they are, um, siblings, things like that. Then we provide them with a copy of the user guide and the tool um, and we're asking them to read the guide, use the tool, rate their child and then complete something we call our thought process questionnaire which is really asking them to think out loud how did you come to your child's rating, were you able to, um, you know, not in a very completely direct way but asking whether or not they did follow our instructions with the user guide if they were thinking about a recall in the past month or um, you know further away than that and part of this is going to help us see if we need to make some tweaks to the tool and be able to see whether um, how parents are using it and then uh, in the second group it talks about the professionals and what they complete it's quite similar um, some of the questions that we ask in the demographics questionnaire ask more about um, their profession and, and the population that they work with. And then in the thought process questionnaire, there's additional questions about when was the last time they saw their child, things like that. But um, basically we're asking very similar information from parents and from the professionals that see their children so that we can make a comparison between the two, how they are rating the child and whether or not they're using, did they rate them the same and are they using the tool in the same way? It's me too. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so um, the last phase of the project, which is validity, we're hoping to begin this summer, 2013. Um, potentially, it could be across the same sites that are participating um, in our reliability stage. Um, in this process, as we, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation, we're going to be validating the psychometric properties of the tool, um, potentially in comparison to the Vineland Adaptive Behavioral Scale, and the Autism Diagnostic Inventory revised. And so the details surrounding validity and uh, where exactly um, we'll be recruiting is to come. Ta-da! Ta -da. <laughs> so uh, we want to thank you for having us. And I think we want to open it up to questions and reiterate what Peter said at the beginning, which is that you know we want to have the questions that um, will 
open us up to think about things differently and see if um, there's something that we're not communicating well enough and if we can do it better. Um, so, Doug, I think Doug, you're going to... Yeah, yeah, uh, we do have a we have quite a few questions uh, lined up in the queue here, so we'll uh, we'll get started. Um, the first question, the first couple questions came right at the beginning of the presentation where you were laying some a lot of the groundwork. And the first one was based it was just why is the classification system being limited to social communication? You did you did mention that that you felt social communication was one of those issues that sort of is a common thread across um, all kids with with autism. Uh, but he's also asking, will there be other categories in addition to social communication? the future or <laughs> we we talked a little bit about that this morning um, I suppose that analogous to the gross motor function and the manual ability and the communication there could be um, what my, my own personal uh, bias and this is only my own view is that if we can get this right other people will hopefully pick up the baton and you know, follow a methodology, uh, some variation of this methodology, and if they want to classify other things like cognitive ability and behavioral function, uh, that would make a lot of sense. I will say again that we do not, we, we see social communication challenges as the central element of autism, and that's why we're focusing on that. Um, and we're deliberately, as we've done in cerebral palsy, are deliberately trying to take this apart a little bit because a global account of things uh, leaves us with a lot, uh, a lot of detail that we don't have. You might be motorically very skilled but cognitively very limited with cerebral palsy and somebody else might have significant functional limitations and be a full-time power wheelchair user doing their PhD as one of our colleagues is here. So we, it's very hard to homogenize this into one uh, score, but when, if one takes it apart, that could be done. All right. Uh, the next question uh, is, is says, this person was told that this, the CFCS is usable with the ASD population and other delays. For example, S, uh, speech language pathologists, uh, I'm assuming in Ontario, she says, are required by the ministry to use this with the focus, which I'm assuming is another tool uh, or an assessment. Uh, how, so she's asking, how is the CFCS different than from the ACSF? And will we, in the future, use both classification system depending on a child's profile? Great question. The CFCS is the communication function classification system, and I mentioned and I neglected to comment on Mary Jo Heidecker. Mary Jo was the person who, who took the lead to develop the communication function classification system uh, as an analog of the GMFCS and the questioner is right that I think people are using the CFCS. The content is more generic about communication uh, and the uh, tool that we're developing which we started developing while the CFCS was still in development. Our tool uh, has tried to look more specifically at the details of social communication in children with ASD than Mary Jo's work did. I know because I was involved with Mary Jo's work. Um, the uh, quick sidebar comment is that the communication function classification system is indeed being used, has been mandated by the preschool speech and language program in Ontario, along with the focus, which is a social function uh, measure that colleagues in Toronto have developed and that is now being used across the province. I think I'll add to that as well. Yeah. I think part, part of um, where we've come from in terms of the, the, the the data that we, we generated in phase one was identifying some of the nuances in autism um, that uh, that we um, are able to embed across these levels, and uh, and I think having Mary Jo um, as part of our team, um, we were able to uh, you know understand the, the differences that way too, and I think uh, when you know the as uh, as Peter mentioned as well, it, the hers is a little bit more generic in terms of sender receiver. Um, and patterns and those sorts of things, um, and uh, so there are, there are differences. But like any tool, I mean, you can 
validate them for any population uh, that we can find it useful. And I definitely think that it could be you know, useful uh, in different ways uh, as, as ours. There is another, uh, I'll just add another thought to this, and <clears throat> that is that the, the question might be asked, well, can you use the gross motor function classification system for populations other than children and young people with cerebral palsy? And the answer is yes and no, depending on what question you're asking. If you've got a group of, if you've got a population of people with spina bifida, you can classify them using the gross motor function classification system as being independently mobile or independently mobile with difficulties or independently mobile part of the time and using a wheelchair and so on. What you cannot do is predict their long-term outcome if they have spina bifida in the way that you can do with cerebral palsy and that is simply because we have followed a very large cohort of children with cerebral palsy for a number of years, some kids up to 10 years, looked at them systematically and been able to predict their long-term outcome and that's where those motor growth curves come from. So there's an example of the potential applicability and the potential non-applicability of a tool depending on the question. Right. Uh, the next question is, uh, and this came in right near the beginning of the presentation, when this was within the first five minutes of the presentation, they, you were mentioning the, some of the focus groups that have been involved. Uh, the person is asking, what were the professional backgrounds of the clinicians involved in the focus groups? Um, very similar to the ones that we're suggesting parents nominate as raters for phase two, um, and that is is speech language pathologists, psychologists, um, psychometrists, occupational therapists, developmental um, pediatricians. Social work? We have a social work? I don't work? think we had social no. work. Um, is that it? I think that was it. And then, um, you know, we we're, you know, had a great opportunity to have a whole group of educators that work with um, children with autism in um, childcare settings. And we had a similar question where the person is just asking, and then this I'm, I'm pretty sure it came in before you got to this section of the presentation, but uh, she's asking who would complete the survey or slash screening, teachers, speech language pathologists, assisted. You did go into quite a bit of detail about, you know, recreational therapists and, and pretty much anyone who knows the child well. Do you, do you have anything to add to that about who would be the one completing the survey? Well, we're, I think we're going to find that out during our um, reliability stage. Um, we think that because of the, the influence that we've had from all of our different members of our focus groups, that it could be used by any of those professionals that are, know the child well. That's right. And, and I think the importance is, is that it, the, the tool is in, in such plain language that it, it should be uh, easy to, to look at um, and, and if you know the child, um, understand which um, uh, level they fall into. So again, one of the, the goals that has forced us to continue to revise, revise, revise is does this make sense if people understand the same things when they read these words on paper? And that's one of the key reasons why we have this thought process questionnaire to make sure even if they've rated the child the same way, are they thinking about the same things? And in part that that goes back to how we've been thinking about autism in the field clinically and in research, focusing on impairments often. And I think um, trying to get people to think about abilities and, and, uh, and functioning and not trying to overinterpret why they're doing things are things that we really want to uh, slow people down on in terms of their, um, um, their, their reasoning so we can understand how they're rating children. Um, and, and again, why we want so many people who know the child uh, to be involved is to make sure that we are capturing the same um, pieces of evidence that uh, that result in a, in a rating so that we have a universal understanding of what functioning is um, within the tool. If I may add just a quick comment, we, we might well have a group of children who are, who are functioning in, in ACSF level three and those children might be functioning, I'm picking up on Brianna's comment, might be functioning in that level for a variety of reasons. Uh, one child might be very anxious and if one understood the why once having classified them, if this child is, has a lot of anxiety then the management of that child's anxiety uh, might help them perform and function better. Whereas another child might be cognitively more limited and the intervention for that child might be quite different. So 
we have kids who are functioning at a similar level, the explanations might be different. All right. Uh, the next question we have is uh, the person's asking if a speech language pathologist was involved in the project because she goes on to ask, have you reviewed the CERTS uh, model, uh, S-C-E-R-T-S, uh, by Presant and Weatherby? Uh, and it because it has three classification levels, uh, have you looked at that as a comparison to this tool at all? We haven't, and I think the, um, the person that asked the question actually contacted me by email, and I haven't had a chance to uh, discuss um, her recommendation to look at it with the group, but no, we didn't include, we were not aware of that model or theory when we were developing our tool. But, but just to play off of that too, within our focus groups, uh, we had a strong presence uh, of a speech and language pathologists who, um, who have been aware of other models out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and whether they've been clinical tools that they've used in their centers or um, or models that have been um, uh, provided uh, or, or just sort of available in the literature. And I think the, um, the understanding of, of some of these models is that there's sometimes a mixture of, of the constructs within them. Um, and I think that's kind of where we... Uh, you know, made sure that we were just, um, working within the, the boundaries of social communication for this age group. I mean, there there are um, other work. There's work by uh, Wing and Gould in 1979 that talked about different um, classification sorts of levels that are clinically meaningful. But again, um, in terms of how we've decided to look at it, it it's abilities focused. Um, and so I think some of these things we will continue to uh, to, to reference, um, but uh, but definitely uh, uh, equally important is that some of it has been infused in some ways just because we, we our, our focus group um, participants have, I guess, been influenced. Mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. That's true. And Mary Jo Heidecker is a speech language pathologist with a PhD. All right. Uh, the next question we have is, um, she's asking, why do the children require a diagnosis since some children will present with social communication challenges but not receive a, an autism diagnosis, particularly when we are attempting to get services to children pre-diagnosis in order to speed access to services? She feels that this would be, a very, would be very helpful to clinicians and administrators alike. I would say probably number one, um, when we were developing the tool, we were looking at what people's experiences were with children with a diagnosis. Um, it doesn't mean that at, you know, at some point that children that don't have a diagnosis, it, it won't be able to be used, but we didn't base it on uh, information about kids that don't have a diagnosis. So we want to make sure that it's used with children uh, with ASD. We, we want to make sure, in any, like in any tool development, that we have a population um, that we can uh, focus on. Um, and so to have a reliable diagnosis from an ADOS uh, or a, you know, a constellation of, of clinical uh, tools, at least we know that um, our population that we're working with is relatively pure in terms of diagnoses. And again, as Martha said, it doesn't mean that we can't begin to study other populations of children without a diagnosis or with social communication disorders as the DSM-5 will be introducing. Um, I mean, there's so many other potentials in terms of exploring um, groups, but I think um, as, a, as a starting point to have a strong foundation uh, in any tool development, we need to have a defined population. And I would just add one more comment that uh, I, I agree with the concern that's been raised and um, with what's been, I want to underscore that at this point, when we're describing what we're doing, we can say we knew all these children had received a formal diagnosis based on whatever uh, approach had been taken. Um, there is certainly the possibility of using this tool more widely in future, and we can explore that, and others can explore that. Uh, the I, I want to go back to my example of kids with spina bifida. If we saw a two-year-old who had some mobility problems and didn't have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, we might classify their function on the GMFCS, but if that child has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, their prognosis and their pattern of motor development over time are going to be very different than somebody in a similar level, somebody with cerebral palsy in a similar level. 
Um, so again, for the purpose of describing how many kids need wheelchairs, that might be useful. For the purpose of predicting what this child's function is going to be like two or five or ten years down the line, that the application of the GMFCS to a child with a neurodisability uh, different from CP would be inappropriate until such evidence is available. Right. Um, I'm just going to mix a couple of questions here together. There were a number of questions around, specifically around social communication. One was about, do, do you have a definition for social communication? And the other was more along the lines of, is there any correlation with social communication and verbal skills? So as uh, we were talking a little bit about before, the, uh, the constructs coming out of our focus groups, um, really the, the definition of social communication is grounded in the intent, um, you know, the social in intent uh, of their um, communication as well as the skills and strategies provided. I think generally that's, that's the um, working definition, I guess, that we have in terms of what we mean, uh, what we're talking about in terms of social communication. Um, and then the second question was, I, I missed that, Doug, what was it? Second half? Uh, any, any correlation with uh, social communication and verbal skills? Uh, at, the, at this point, we haven't correlated um, uh, any of, uh, haven't correlated the tool with any of the, um, uh, the data that have come in yet. Um, and I think that'll be something we will determine. Um, but as I mentioned before, our goal was to um, to really uh, make sure that um, verbal skills didn't dictate whether a child would be higher, um, uh, score a higher rating um, than others. So uh, we'll we'll know in terms of our uh, our early testing um, if we've been successful with that. Again, uh, Peter, you're adding a comment. <clears throat> um, the uh, the questions that people are asking are really exciting because there's uh, it suggests that people are seeing potential uh, you know applications of this kind of a tool. Um, we're being very uh, modest in our expectations, which is to try to create the tool. Once it's there, uh, these kinds of explorations can go on endlessly and should go on endlessly to look at you know which things go with and which things don't go with other things um, and as but one example with the gross motor function classification system we've published several papers in which we report on health status and functional status in other domains uh, of people with cerebral palsy using the gross motor function classification system as the stratification variable and we know how how strongly or how weakly intellectual difficulty correlates with GMFCS level, uh, how poorly quality of life, self-reported quality of life, correlates with gross motor function classification levels. And that's important information. And that's the kind of thing we hope people will be able to do over the next 10 or 20 years if we can actually get a system that works. Um, I just wanted to add that we do in our user guide define what we mean by social communication uh, simply and in more detail um, and how it reads is social communication is the ability to communicate with or without words for the purpose of interacting with others and then we you know we and we talk about how uh, the user will have to make judgments about the purpose for which the child is communicating and how they're communicating and this is, you know, why someone can't just use this that doesn't have a relationship or has, has worked with the child before. We want people to be able to make the judgments because it's based on experience and exposure. Now that comment sort of leads into the next uh, question where the, the person is asking if the tool is not to be used based on a if the tool is not to be used based on a more brief observa observation, is there any role for this tool in a diagnostic clinic? In other words, is it preferable to have parents fill this out even though they aren't experts in communication as opposed to having clinicians trained in this sort of assessment to classify the child's skills based on available information? That's a, that's a very, very good question. We, we've, we've definitely, um, uh, in, in this stage of testing, um, um, grappled with the idea of where the gold standard is. Um, and I think, uh, you know, is it parents who see the children every day? Is it the clinicians who see many different children? Uh, and so I think, I think what we are hoping to find in terms of this uh, early phase two results is, uh, you know, how, what, what parents, what 
clinicians are looking at, um, how closely are they, and, uh, and what information in terms of partnership can they share um, to, to come up uh, with um, a rating. Um, so I think we, we're definitely, um, you know, like everything else with this tool, we're, we have everyone's hand on the steering wheel here trying to steer this into a, 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 you know, a successful, useful tool for the field. And I think what right now um, we're, we're continuing to, um, to wait to see how, how this can best be used. But definitely... Uh, that suggestion is a very cool idea. Yeah. All right, just a couple of comments. Um, Brianna, I don't know if Peter and Martha have sort of elbowed you to the back of the room uh, for some reason, but your, your, your volume has gone down just a little bit. So if I can just get you to just a little more volume uh, or more directed at, the, at your microphone uh, would be helpful because you've got some great, uh, your, your answers are great, and we want to make sure the audience can hear them. And uh, we do have a... Yeah. They were asking with their elbow pads next time, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we do have a couple of questions, and it is just after 12 o'clock here. Uh, we do have until 12.30 Eastern time scheduled for this session, but... Uh, uh, I get the sense that a few people are, have, have had to leave or are thinking about having to leave for other meetings that they might be missing. But uh, we are recording this session. So if you do have to miss the last few minutes of the uh, question period, uh, we are recording it. We do post it on the on the CAFC Knowledge Exchange Network at ken.cafc.org. And if you just uh, uh, search for uh, the, the um, uh, uh, ACSF uh in the search bar, I'm sure this will be the, 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 the page that comes up. So you'll be able to listen to the full recording uh, on that site. So if you do have to leave, by all means, and uh, be sure to come back and check out the recording later on. Uh, we, do ha we do have quite a few more questions here, so we'll just uh, try, and, try and get through them before, uh, before, we, uh, before our presenters have to leave. Um, the next question is, uh, uh, the person is asking if you can speak a little bit more about the nonverbal and verbal classification, as this is very a very useful classification in the terms of understanding the best way to communicate with the child. Uh, the nonverbal verbal um, in our, in our user guide, and, and Martha can uh, can speak to this a bit more too. Um, we we do have um, some descriptions of you know gesturing and. Um, expressions that can fall in the realm of social communication yeah in terms of um, what you can observe and, and, and how and, and the pictures that can describe this behavior so I think we've we've, uh, we've dedicated almost a full page it looks like in the user guide to describe some examples of what can be observed uh, what falls into the um, nonverbal uh, realm of, uh, of, of communicating we did have a couple of a number of questions about people asking if they can see this information, like the the, the document that you sh that you showed some images of, uh, and the user guide and that sort of thing. Is that available on the CanChild website anywhere? It isn't because um, we are, as we said, in our reliability stage right now. So we know that there's going to be some changes to it. Um, right now, if parents are participating or professionals are participating, then obviously they're going to see a copy so that they can um, rate a child. Um, and some of them are keeping the copies, so they have it. I'm not sure that we're ready to distribute it widely uh, because it is a draft form and, um, you know, there's probably going to be some changes to it. Let me just clarify that we are clearly selling ideas, but we will not be selling the system. So it's not a question of keeping this close to, to the vest because we want to make money on it. Uh, when it's ready, like the GMFCS and the MAX and the CFCS, it will be available on a website for free downloading. The concern that we have is a couple of things. One is, as Martha says, if we, uh, if we uh, have another version, we don't want people using the last version because we've, we've improved it, or we think we've improved it to the next version. The second is we don't want people um, with the best of intentions making modifications to it um, and changing it. Um, we can't control that once it's out there, but at this point in, in its development, we're just trying to be uh, fairly protective of both the material and of um, the need to be very thoughtful and cautious about it. And when do you expect it to be avail I know, uh, available? I know I know your the research phase is, it goes until early next year, I believe. But when when do you predict it might be available for people? 
hopefully a year from now. A year from now. Right. Um, we're we're currently writing up uh, writing a paper that describes some of what we've talked about today and how we got there, so that the when we actually have the system and have some decent evidence that it is reliable in the sense of people using it consistently, and that it's valid in the sense that different kids in different levels actually are assessed differently on other tools uh, then we will uh, publish it um, I'm uh, by far the oldest person in this conversation um, and I'm aware of lots of tools that get developed with good intentions and get out there before they've been field tested and it turns out that they don't work as well as they should and then we everybody gets annoyed and um, you know it's easy to discredit something by having a premature um, publication so we're trying to be we're just being cautious um, I'll just add I think if people are interested in seeing a version um, we may not be able to do that now but they're welcome to email me and I can keep them on file so when we are ready to share um, they'll be on the list. So my um, email, I think everyone has it, but it's mcousin at mcmaster.ca. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just uh, put it up on the screen. It is on the Knowledge Exchange Network, but uh, people can see that on the screen uh, in, a, in just a second. Uh, your contact information, phone number, and email for, for all three of our presenters are up on the uh, Knowledge Exchange Network page there. Uh, so we'll just get back to the questions here. Uh, the next question is, is culture and background of participants being considered when recruiting? For example, will you consider f families where English is not their first language? Yeah, it's definitely information we're, we're collecting in our, um, our demographics questionnaire. Uh, definitely recognizing, too, that, um, you know, the... Uh, realm of social communication varies, uh, and and we're looking at it from the Western culture perspective. Um, we we then we really do plan to examine uh, in detail um, who's who is involved in our reliability phase and um, and what some of the challenges could be moving forward. That being said, you know we've we've really worked hard on on making this plain plain language for families, uh, but. Um, also knowing that uh, a lot of families that have uh, English as a second language um, you know, uh, could, could find, uh, have difficulty. Uh, but that's something that we, we do need to, um, to uh, e explore um, as we uh, test the tool. Uh, maybe you could remind us what the target age group is for this, and, and the, the next question is asking, are you considering a wider uh, age range in the future? So um, for this tool and this study, we're looking at children that are three years old um, and under six. Um, but I know that there is a plan in the future to um, expand the age and develop a tool that would be um, looking at the social communication abilities of the ages above that and below it. And, and similar to, as, as you would have seen, the GMFCS had um, age band uh, two to four, I believe, but yeah. there are different age bands um, um, that go up to over, is it 18? Um, for the GMFCS, and I think it's the same idea for this. I mean, some of the work that I'm involved with is also linked to transitions in autism, and, and I'm chomping at the bit to try to get this uh, done to move on to uh, older population, but uh, I think in general we need to you know uh, make sure that we, we do this right and in a systematic way. Um, you know, explore um, uh, social communication in each of these age groups so that we can, um, as we build on this research, we can then see the, um, you know, the, the, the natural history uh, across age groups. So it's a hugely important, important question too. All right. Uh, this person's asking, have you already acquired the number of children that are needed to participate in the reliability and validity study or are you still recruiting? No, we're still recruiting. And if anyone is interested in hearing more about that, uh, they can contact me. All right. And again, Martha's uh, contact information is up on the screen there. Uh, the next question is, will, will you be adding a trajectory for each level to predictability in the future, similar to the GMFCS? Uh, That's Brianna's career. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, I, I, as I said, it's it's hugely important to to explore the the patterns over time. Um, we we definitely 
I mean, in my clinical experience and seeing children with a range of abilities uh, with autism, definitely don't see it being a smooth um, a slope. Um, and so uh, what will be interesting is to see what the patterns are um, of ability and, and then the meaning within each level um, to, to help us understand um, better what, to, what children are doing and why. Um, so yeah, definitely down the road this is important, but as we, we've said uh, several times, um, we need to understand what we're looking, uh, what we're looking for first, uh, and, and doing that consistently is, is what this project is doing. And, and then if we can do that here, we do that in older populations, and then we begin to um, do lots, a lot more interesting things to, to help them. Yeah. As, as a diehard baseball fan, I'll use a baseball analogy. Um, when you're trying to hit the baseball, um, you really need to keep your head still and keep your head on the ball because if you pull your head off the ball to see what's going on, you're going to miss the pitch every time. We we recognize the ideas that people are bringing forward, which is which is great that they're recognizing them with us, but we really have to d get this thing um, in, into a state that we have some confidence that whatever we're looking at right now uh, is meaningful. Um, Nobody's asked what is the u a usual question, which is, do you think kids will stay on the same level over time? And the answer is, we suspect that they will not. And that's related to the question that's just been asked about trajectories. But some kids, I mean, there, it's possible that there will be kids who are in level X who over time go to level, to, to, a, to a less functional level because they have a degenerative problem of some sort. It's possible that kids will stay in the same level and it's possible that there will be kids who will change and improve their abilities. In fact, we expect that that is likely to happen, which is why the trajectories work becomes so important. But there's a lot of work to be done before we get there, and it's very much in our uh, on our radar to try to do that. All right. Uh, just a couple more questions on the list. So if anyone has any uh, any more questions, uh, please uh, you know type them in uh, quickly. And uh, otherwise, we'll be just we'll be wrapping up after two more uh, relatively short questions here. Um, the next question is: Once you obtain details from a child using this tool, is there a goal of suggesting uh, the rehab rehab activities for their social development? That's one, that's one of the ideas that that um, I think can come out of this tool. Um, you know, and, and really limited to social communication, um, and I think that that speaks to the point that I think uh, to the question that was asked uh, early on in this uh, question period uh, about other categories uh, that can be developed. Um, I think in terms of uh, clinical goal setting, um, development, uh, understanding, um, you know, of, uh, of what the family's um, interests and needs are. Uh, I think this becomes uh, this tool becomes a, a, a wonderful platform to, to communicate what a child can do and how how to begin working on um, the next step in terms of development uh, or understanding, um, you know, uh, if, if people are running groups, group sessions, uh, you know, bringing children together that are at a similar level um, to, to be able to um, learn from each other uh, or together. So I definitely think that it's it's uh, it's it's useful. It'll be useful for uh, clinical work. I think that that'll be an important research question to explore next, uh, and, and and how this tool, once we get um, uh, the validity and reliability testing done, um, what what it can mean in terms of uh, usefulness in terms of uh, uh, clinical practice. And, and also for educational purposes, as we've mentioned before, because the early childhood educators that were involved in our focus groups were just really, uh, really interested and excited about uh, a tool like this that, um, you know, they could then speak the same language as the, the clinicians, uh, as, the, as the parents, and everyone uh, who have the child's uh, best interest at heart will know, um, you know, uh, will, will have the same understanding um, in terms of um, helping the child achieve their life goals. Uh, speaking of the focus groups, uh, the, this person has asked: Has, the, has any consideration been given given to involving people with autism in the focus groups to glean their input? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think uh, Mary Jo uh, in our in our, uh, our on our team had mentioned that because I think she had used in the development of the CFCS, she had used some youth with cerebral palsy. 
uh, we, we had thought about it. Um, and uh, I mean, given the age range that we're working with, we thought that um, it's uh, rather young to, to be able to uh, involve them in, in, a, in a group to, uh, to generate this uh, information and as well. And if we thought about getting older youth to reflect on their abilities at a preschool age, that might be a bit tough, um, a tall order as well. Um, but I, I definitely think that um, you know, uh, in terms of um, moving forward with other age bands um, uh, and children with um, uh, better abilities, um, uh, just just in terms of uh, their age themselves, I think it would be uh, something that we will definitely consider. And the last question we have on the list here, uh, unless someone is quickly has their fingers flying on the on their keyboard, um, this will be the last question. Uh, she's saying that the VAB is not very useful for capturing the communication of nonverbal clients. So why did you pick this as a validity and reliability comparison? Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, this was something that we we are continuing to. Uh, Figure out um, whether the the Vineland or the Vineland Two is is relevant for nonverbal. I, I can't remember offhand uh, if there were exceptions to it. But Peter has his well. Here. Part of the reason is that we are likely to try to take advantage of information that's already available about the children, and because the Vineland and the ADOS and ADIR are widely used, we are hoping to be able to get access to. All to existing relatively contemporaneous information rather than doing all these assessments ourselves. So there's no disagreement with the comment that this person has made about, the, uh, about some limitations with the vine line, but essentially we're trying to look at what's available already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Point taken, and I think that's something we'll, we'll need to yeah. uh, ensure in terms of our, our validation process. All right. And we did have uh, uh, Elaine, Elaine Orbein, CAFC's uh, president and CEO, wanted to make a quick comment here. Go ahead, Elaine. Uh, thanks, Doug. I, I have Peter and um, Brianna and Martha. What an outstanding presentation. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on, first of all, just a, a almost a personal comment, the trajectories piece that you've talked about, sort of that I'll refer to it as a little bit more futuristic, is so, so exciting and, and, uh, and, and unprecedented. And so I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, as so many are, I'm sure, keeping my fingers crossed uh, and look forward to hearing about that, uh, that development piece. Uh, Peter, when you began the presentation, you you talked about knowledge translation being an ongoing um, component of your work, and and uh, uh, Doug and I, uh, representing CAFC, certainly understand that and really believe in that uh, in that philosophy and and, um, and and way of doing things. So I just want to extend to the three of you and and your other colleagues um, an opportunity to come back and, and perhaps consider today a series, uh, the first part of the series, and uh, to bring the findings of, of the new data that you will be receiving as a part of your uh, ongoing pilots, etc., to, to our CAFC community again. Obviously, this is such an important area, and we'd really like to support your knowledge translation activities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we have exhausted the uh, question period, uh, if not uh, our presenters as well with that long question period. Um, so uh, do any of our presenters have any final comments before we wrap this up? Anything they'd, you'd like to say? I want to thank, I want to thank Cassie, and I want to thank all the people that ask questions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, really helpful. So thank you for responding to our need to hear about ideas and to um, reflect on both what we're doing and what we're not doing. <laughs> you now have some fingerprints on the work as well as you've <laughs> gotten us to continue to think about uh, what we're planning ahead. All right. Thank you all. Thank you.
All right. Well, I'll also take this opportunity to thank thank our presenters. It was a fantastic presentation, as you can always tell by the the number of questions that get answered. You can tell people were definitely engaged in the content, and by the number that we had. This was one of our larger webinars we've had in, in quite a while. Uh, so it's great to see the interest in the topic. Um, and as always, as I mentioned a couple of times, we do record this, and the recording should be up. Uh, usually, I get them up by Monday of the following week, uh, and you can find them all on our Knowledge Exchange Network there. And uh, we do uh, these webinars typically uh, on every Wednesday. We don't always have uh, we don't have a topic every single Wednesday but when we do them it's typically Wednesdays at 11 Eastern time and if you do have any more uh, questions about the webinar program you can always go to CAFC's website at www.cafc.org and you can click on the CAFC presents uh, tool uh, section in our tools and resource uh, page of our website and there we have a calendar of events we have uh, in the top left you'll see if it ever comes up you'll see a, uh, a uh, link to subscribe to the email list which will allow you to be informed of any upcoming webinars or any follow-up for this webinar as well uh, so again thanks to our presenters and thanks to the audience for coming and you'll uh, receive an email notification when the when the video is available and uh, we'll hopefully we'll see you on our next webinar in a, in a few weeks all right we'll talk to you soon bye